Okay, so we're there in Genesis chapter number 35, and last time, back in Genesis 34, we, we, if you remember, we saw the importance of protecting your children. We, we looked at that, um, especially when they're younger, and, and girls even when they're older. If you remember Jacob, he didn't protect his daughter Dinah, and she ended up getting defiled, remember back in, back in chapter 34? Mm-hmm. And in fact, the whole chapter ended with, with basically, there was a whole pile of people that, that, got, that got killed, you know, that they got slaughtered. Um, they had nothing to do with the earlier event that went on, but they ended up getting slaughtered by Simeon and Levi, and that was kind of like a fulfilment of what um, of what James talks about in James one fifteen, which is then when Luth has conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Okay, and we saw that. That's what played out in chapter thirty four. In fact, it also says in Proverbs chapter fourteen twelve, it says there is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. I mean, I doubt that Shechem thought to himself, hey, here's this attractive lady, I want a young lady, I want to sleep with her. He probably didn't think, I'm going to die, my dad's going to die, in fact, pretty much all the men in, the, in that town are going to be killed. He probably didn't think that. But that, you know, he probably thought there was nothing wrong with what he was doing. I mean, don't many people think that today? There's nothing wrong with sleeping someone, is there? Okay. But in fact, the Bible says the way which seemed, in fact, it actually says it twice. It says that in Proverbs 14.12, and it says the same thing in Proverbs 16.25. repeats the same thing again. So it's obviously a key thing. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but ends thereof as ways of death. But we're on chapter 36 now, so, so 35 now, excuse me. So look in verse number 1. Chapter 35, verse 1. Have a look and see what it says. And God said unto Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel, and dwell there, and make an altar unto God that appeared unto thee when thou fleddest from the face of Esau thy brother. So God tells Jacob to go to Bethel. Now Bethel is another word for, if you flick back to Genesis 28, Bethel is another name that basically means the house of God. If you look back at um, Genesis chapter number 28 and verse number 16, Genesis 28 and verse number 16, it says, And Jacob awaked out of his sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. And he was afraid. And said, how dreadful is this place? This is none other but the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for his pillows. And he set it up for a pillar and poured oil upon the top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel. But the name of that city was called Luz at the first. So, so basically, um, you know, Bethel means house of God. Okay? And we saw what happened there. What did Jacob do? With the house of God. That was where he met God. Okay, He met God in the house of God. And also notice he set up a pillar. Now the first, when I hear that word pillar, that reminds me of where it talks about in the New Testament. In fact, if you keep your finger there, but in 1 Timothy chapter number 3, 1 Timothy chapter number 3 and verse number 15, 1 Timothy 3.15 says, 1 Timothy 3.15, Paul writing to Timothy says, but, but if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, we saw Bethel was the house of God, in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Okay, so we see the house of God is also called the church of God, and it's also called, it's the pillar and ground of the truth. Now the thing, the thing about that is today, the church is supposed to be the pillar and ground of the truth. In other words, if you want to find the truth, you should be able to go to church to find the truth. But sadly today, many churches are no longer the pillar and ground of the truth. Because today, we actually are living in a day when there is a great falling away that's taking place. Um, you're there in First Timothy. Have a look at um, 2 Thessalonians, chapter number 2. 2 Thessalonians, chapter number 2. And verse number 1 says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. Paul say, look, we beseech you, brethren, by, and he's talking about Jesus coming back and us being gathered. Let's talk about the rapture. He says, when Jesus comes back and we're all gathered together, he says, we beseech you by this, he says, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as at the day of Christ is at hand. He says, don't be shaken or troubled, as though the day of Christ is, is happening any minute, because it's actually not. Some people sort of say Jesus is going to come back any time. They say it's imminent. He says, no. He says, is this the day of Christ is at hand? Look at verse number three. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come. He's saying that day is not going to come. He says, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, 
the son of perdition. So he's saying, look, the day of Christ is not going to come except first there's going to be a falling away and also it talks about the, the, the man of sin, the Antichrist, is going to be revealed. That's going to happen before Jesus comes back. You might say, well, what's this falling away? Well, the Bible talks about there being a falling away from the faith. Where basically God's people, God's churches, end up being... It's like, in fact, Jesus said, and I um, don't need to turn there, but Luke 18, 8, Jesus said, Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? That's what Jesus said. When he comes back, is he going to find faith on the earth? It doesn't sound like there's going to be a lot of faith around when he comes back. Okay? And so, this is kind of the day that we're moving in today. I mean, things that used to be taken for granted have now been cast aside, you know? And within churches, where, where things that were commonplace. I mean, it used to be that, that a man and woman would get married. That used to be, it was just standard. Now, that's not the case anymore. People think it's fine just, just to live together, just to sleep together. You know? Now, it's not in all cases. There are many people, who many Christian people, who grow up and they remain virgins until they get married. Many, many people do that. Okay, And that's the right thing to do. But the fact is, there are many churches where that's not common anymore. Okay? And um, how is it that this false teaching happens? How is it that people turning away from the plain teachings of the Bible, how does it happen? Well, basically what happens is that false teachers, are, they get allowed into a church and they teach all sorts of heresy. I mean, uh, there's an example that's particularly on my mind just recently. Um, there's a local brethren church that recently, in one of their services, they played a video clip from an Anglican pastor by the name of Sam Albury. And this guy, this Anglican pastor, identifies himself as same-sex attracted. You know what that is? Mm. He says he's same-sex So this Anglican pastor, he says, yeah, I'm same-sex attracted. Yeah, that's what he says he is, okay? Now, even apart from that, the first question that comes to me is, hang on, why is this guy a pastor if he's not married with faithful children? I mean, you know, in fact, we'll look at it in a minute. They also recommend listening to videos by Jackie Hill Perry. She is described as an ex-lesbian rapper slash poet. She's a woman who preaches and teaches men. Yeah, she teaches and preaches, she preaches and teaches to men. Sometimes, to be honest, I have to pinch myself and say, is this really happening? I wonder, is this really happening? In Psalm 11.3, in fact we sang it before, in Psalm 11.3, it says, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? If the basic things, the foundational truths are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Now, this morning I preached on the mystery of the gospel. Mm. The fact that, you know, the basic gospel, which is a mystery to many people, the fact that we've all sinned and therefore we deserve death and hell. The fact that God came to earth as a man, Jesus Christ. He died for our sins and rose again the third day. That eternal life is a free gift that was paid 100% by Jesus. It's received by faith alone, not by anything we do, not by any works, and it cannot be lost. Now, the gospel is a basic fundamental truth that has actually disappeared from many churches. But even having said that, many churches that have been right on the gospel start to veer away from the truth. They take plain, easy-to-understand scriptures... And then they start to ignore them. You know, I mean, I've also come across a number of people from that Brethren Church I referred to when we've been out soul winning that I've talked to, and they're saved. When I go through the gospel, they're saved. They know the gospel. They're trusting in Jesus Christ alone. But I mean, look, look at this. Um, turn, I mentioned before, turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. <clears throat> Excuse me. 1 Timothy chapter number 3. And verse number. I actually have a look at 1 Timothy 2, actually, to start with. Um, <clears throat> yeah, the church that I'm referring to, it wasn't actually that long ago that this church took a stand against women in leadership. Okay, They used to take a stand against women in leadership. As far as I know, they still only would have men preaching and teaching in the church, as far as I know. Mm -hmm. But have a look at this. This is, what, this is what the Bible says, just to see if it's hard to understand. First Timothy, look at chapter 2, verse 11. The Bible says, Let the woman learn in silence, with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to use of authority over the man, but to be in silence. 
For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. That is a warning that when women are preaching in church, there is going to be deception. Now, there can be deception when there's men preaching too. But it's a guarantee that if you've got women preaching, there will be deception. Look at verse uh, chapter number 3. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. And we know that a, a bishop is used interchangeably. Bishop, elder, and pastor are used interchangeably. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behaviour, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in all subjection with all gravity, in subjection with all gravity, for if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God. Now from looking at that, who is supposed to teach and preach in a church? Is it supposed to be men or women? Pretty obvious, it's supposed to be men. And if, in fact, I think a child could understand those verses. In fact, I think my, some of my children, they do understand those verses. Mm. Who is supposed to be a pastor? Is it supposed to be a single man? Or is it supposed to be a married man who's got children? So you know whether he can rule his own house or not. Clearly, it's supposed to be a married man. So why is a church that says it believes the Bible, that says the leadership in a church should be made up of men who are married and rule their house as well, how, who says that women um, you know, um, shouldn't be preaching in a church, how come they're then going to go and tell its people to go and listen to or actually play videos of people who are blatantly disobeying what the scripture clearly teaches? You know, I mean, how much longer do you think their other positions are going to last? Do you think it's going to last, or do you think they're on the downward slope? I think they're a long way down, the, down, down that slope. The fact is, we are living in the middle of the time of great falling away. I mean, when a Presbyterian church puts up a sign out the front celebrating same-sex marriage in Australia, saying, well done Aussies, that's not really a big surprise. You know, when you see that sign that they had out the front of the church saying, well done Australia for legalising you know, same-sex marriage, that's not a big surprise when they do that. But I must admit that I didn't expect to see a Brethren church mm-hmm. recommending its people go away and listen to, mm-hmm. to use their terms, same-sex attracted female preachers. I'm, I, I was shocked when I heard that, to be honest. Turn if you to Acts chapter 20. Turn to Acts chapter number 20. <clears throat> Acts chapter number 20. We are living in the middle of a great falling away. Acts chapter 20 and verse number 27. Now the fact is, there's always been heresies coming in. There's always been wrong teaching coming in. Acts chapter 20 and verse number 27, even in Paul's time. But in our day, it's getting into the last one. Acts 20 verse 27, Paul says, For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Not some of it, not just the popular bits, but all of it. He says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. What does Paul say is going to happen? Grievous wolves are going to come in. Verse 30. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. People are rising, speaking perverse things. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years, I ceased not to warn everyone night and day with tears. So Paul, he repeatedly warned the Ephesian elders. He, report, he warned them over and over again. But when grievous wolves are on the loose, you know, it's the right thing to do. You know, I mean, I, mean, I sometimes feel like, am I warning people too much? But I kind of feel like you need to warn people because... That's what Paul did. Paul did that. He kept warning. He warned. I mean, how did he warn? Look, look back, back at verse 20. Verse number 20 says, And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house. So what Paul did, he kept back nothing. So do you know what it means what he kept back? He said nothing that's profitable. Well, the Bible tells us all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. So what Paul didn't hold back, he didn't hold back the Bible. He didn't say, oh, there's some parts of the Bible I've been not preached. There's some parts I've been not say because that's not popular. Because there are lots of parts of the Bible that are just not popular. 
Okay, but Paul said, no, I didn't keep back anything. I didn't keep back anything at all. But we're getting back, back to Genesis. I just needed to um, uh, get that off my chest. Back in um, Genesis chapter number 35. Just remember that though. We are in the time of great falling away. Genesis chapter number 35 and verse number 2. <coughs> Genesis 35 verse 2. Then Jacob said unto his household and to all that were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you and be clean and change your garments. So Jacob tells his household to put away the strange gods. You might say, well, why, why do they have strange gods among them? Why do they have false gods? You know, things that they worship instead of the real God. Um, that's not what they, they shouldn't have, should they? And so it's interesting that this, this warning... Where are they going? They're going to Bethel, and then there's a warning to put away these other gods. There's an element in which when you come to church, that's when you're going to be warned to put away things that are wrong. Put away these false gods. Okay. Um, also, it says, be clean. Change your garments. This is, you know, we should be clean. You know, that shows respect for God. We should have respect for God by being clean ourselves. So obviously, that's clean in mind, clean in body. You know, it's just, it's, you know, I mean, there's a, what's the saying? Cleanliness is next to godliness. Um, that might not be a biblical expression, but but it's not it's not a bad well put it this way it is a bad testimony to be dirty to, to put people away from the gospel by the way you present yourself you know and, and that's just a simple fact we should be clean he says wash and be clean um, be clean and change your garments um, verse number verse number three verse number three says and let us arise and go up to Bethel. And I will make there an altar unto God who answered me in the day of my distress and was with me in the way which I went. So go up to Bethel. Going to church is actually, it's interesting he says go up to Bethel. Going to church is part of like an upward spiral. Okay, people, in everyone's lives, people make choices. Each day, each during the day, many times, we choose to do this and we choose to do that. And we can choose to do right things, or we can choose to do wrong things. And when we choose to do right, it's like a right decision and another one. It's like an upward spiral, onward and upward. Okay? Mm. But compared to, Bethel's described as going up to Bethel. Many times in the Bible we read about going down to Egypt. Remember people went down to Egypt? Remember Abraham went down to Egypt? Various people, they, they go down to Egypt. Okay? And that's kind of like a downward spiral. That's where like, you make a bad choice, and then it leads to a bad choice, followed by a bad choice. So, you know, making right decisions leads to more right decisions. Making wrong decisions leads to wrong, more wrong decisions. And the fact is, I mean, sometimes people run away from church when things aren't going well. Something bad goes on in your life, things aren't going well, and you think, oh, I don't want to go to church, because, I mean, I'll have to put a smile on my face, I'll have to be friendly to people. It's like, oh, I just don't want to go there. But the fact is that... When things aren't going well, that's the time when you really need to come to church. You know, I don't mind if you come to church and you have a sad look on your face. I don't have mind if you come to church and have a mad look on your face. Hey, that's fine. You know, I might preach about um, you know having a having a cheerful countenance, but that's for honest. I don't mind. I don't mind because it's the right thing to do. It's the thing that's going to help you. Okay, and that we need to remember that you know, we, making right choices leads to more right choices. And making wrong choices leads to more wrong choices. That's why it's an important thing that people get baptised. When you get saved, the best choice you can make is get baptised straight away. And some people do that. Some people put it off. But, you know, making one right choice will lead to increased chances of making the next right choice. Making the next right choice. Look at verse number four. And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in their hand, and all their earrings which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the oak, which was by Shechem. <coughs> so Jacob, um, it's interesting here. It says, they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in their hand and all the earrings which were in their ears, and Jacob hid them under the oak, which was by Shechem. What do you think he hid them? What do you think that means? What, was he, what were they going to do? Don't you think they were probably going to go back and get them again later? They didn't get rid of them, did they? They just hid them. And sometimes people can, be, people can be like that with thing, bad things in their lives. So they think, I know I shouldn't be doing this, so they maybe they've got bad music they listen to. So they take that and put it away, but they don't get rid of it. They just put it there in case, well, 
I mean, what if I backslide and I want to listen to it again? Well, I don't have to go and buy the CD again, so, you know, et cetera, et cetera, you know? And so it's like that we allow, you know, we, you know, maybe we've got, you know, sort of ungodly clothing that we're wearing. And so we, are oh, well, uh, but it costs lots of money, so I'll just put it away in a shelf, put it in the, in the wardrobe or in the, in, the, in, the, in the attic or something like that, just in case I change later on, you know? Maybe someone, oh, they, I'll, I'll give up drinking, okay? So, and I've, but I've still got all this alcohol in my house. What do I do? Stick it in the attic. Just in case I change my mind later on. That's not the way it should be. We should get rid of these things completely. Get rid of them completely. Okay? So we see Jacob here. He's just hiding them. Okay? In fact, it actually said in Romans 13, 14, it says, But put you on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. In other words, don't allow for think, well, I might sin, so I'll, I'll, I'll just allow it in, in case I go back there. No, don't do that. Get rid of the opportunity. You know, that's a, that, in fact, that's a really important principle in the Christian life, is you want to get, get rid of something that, that could cause you to go down the wrong path. You know, it's fair to think, oh, if I might do that, then get rid of that thing. Jesus said, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Now, he wasn't talking out about physical dismemberment. None of Jesus' disciples disfigured themselves you know but what he was saying is he's saying treat it seriously you know i mean some people there are people who struggle with a sin they might struggle with a sin like pornography if someone struggles with pornography there's something that they shouldn't have do you know what they shouldn't have if anyone that struggles with pornography they shouldn't have a smartphone they shouldn't simple as that if you struggle with pornography you should not have a smartphone or if you do no internet on it. In other words, it's only for ringing. That's all you can have. No, no internet connection. That's what you'd have. Why? Because it's, it's making provision for the flesh. Jesus said it's serious. Get these things away from you. You know? Because sin is dangerous. Um, but interesting, back in verse number four, he says here, put away the... Uh, talks about, yeah. And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in their hand. But look what it also says. And their earrings which were in their ears. Now you might say, he said about putting away the gods, why do they put away their earrings? Why do they put away their earrings? You know, should they have had strange gods with them? Obviously not, they shouldn't have. What about these earrings then? Well, let's have a look and see what the Bible says about earrings. So first of all, look at Proverbs chapter 25. Proverbs chapter 25 and verse number 12. Proverbs chapter 25 and verse number 12. <coughs> Proverbs 25 and verse number 12 says, As an earring of gold and an ornament of fine gold, so is a wise reprover upon an obedient ear. So this is saying, like an, like an earring of gold, that's what a wise reprover upon an obedient ear, like someone who's, who's wisely reproving is telling someone, telling someone off, but it's, they're doing it wisely, and the person who's listening the ear is obedient. So this is clearly a good thing. So a wise reprove on obedient ear, that's a good thing. Therefore, an earring of gold and an ornament of fine gold is also a good thing. So this is saying, is there anything wrong with, with earrings? From Based on this verse, no, it seems like a good thing. What about, um, have a look in Ezekiel chapter number 16. Ezekiel chapter number 16. Ezekiel chapter number 16. And verse number... 11, Ezekiel 16 and verse number 11, Ezekiel 16 and verse number 11, and it says, I deck thee also with ornaments, and put brace, I put bracelets upon my hands, and a chain upon my neck, like a necklace, and I put a jewel on thy forehead, and earrings in thine ears, and a beautiful crown upon mine head, thus wast thou decked with gold and silver, and thy raiment was of fine linen and silk and embroidered work. Thou didst eat fine flour and honey and oil, and thou wast exceeding beautiful. And thou didst prosper into a kingdom, and thy renown went forth among the heathen for thy beauty, for it was perfect through thy comeliness, which I had put upon thee, saith the Lord God. So notice here, God's talking about putting an earring on someone. Now, this is a picture he's talking about, you know, like, like Israel and stuff like that. But the fact is, if... If wearing earrings was a bad thing, if it was a sinful thing, would God then say, and I put earrings on you? No, obviously not. So clearly, it's not a sinful thing to have, to, to have earrings. I mean, the, we've seen some mentions of it here. 
but in this specific, the, the first one it didn't sort of say who it was for, it just said, talked about the earrings themselves. Here this talking about an earring on a woman. Okay, now let's have a look at Judges chapter number 8. Judges chapter number 8 and verse number 24. Judges 8 and verse number 24. <coughs> Judges chapter number 8 and verse number 24. Judges 8, 24 says, And Gideon said unto them, I would desire a quest of you, that you would give me every man the earrings of his prey. Notice what it says here in parentheses. For they had golden earrings because they were Ishmaelites. And they answered, We will willingly give them. And they spread a, a garment and did cast therein every man the earrings of his prey. So here we see these people, the Ishmaelites, had earrings. The men had earrings. Now, were the Ishmaelites, were they godly people? Were they God's people? Or were they sort of the, the ungodly people? They were ungodly people. So these men, and it says specifically, they had earrings because they were Ishmaelites. Obviously, the Ishmaelite men had earrings. Okay? The Israelite men, seemingly, wouldn't have. Otherwise, why would, it wouldn't make any sense to say they had earrings because they were Ishmaelites if everybody had earrings. Okay? So, then have a look at um, Exodus chapter number... Exodus chapter number 32. Exodus chapter number 32. We do see a time when there were Israelites that had earrings. Have a look at this. Exodus chapter 32 and verse number 1. <coughs> Exodus 32 verse number 1. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we want not what has become of him. They say, we don't know what's happened to Moses. And says, look, make us gods. So is it a good thing they're doing? No. Moses got up the mountain. And they're saying, look, let's make some false gods. And Aaron said unto them, break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. And all the people break off the golden earrings which are in their ears and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. So everyone's familiar with the story of the golden calf. What was it made out of? Gold, but it, was out, but it came out of the earrings, didn't it? That's what they did. He says, look, get these earrings. But it's interesting if you look at verse 2, where did these earrings come from? It says, these golden earrings, which are in the ears of your wives of your sons and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. So who had the earrings? The wives did, the sons did, the daughters did. What about the men? The men didn't. They said, bring me the earrings which are in your wives, your sons and your daughters. Okay. And so here we see, it's an interesting picture, where you've got a man who doesn't have earrings, his wife does, but his children, both male and female, do. And the fact is, I can actually talk from experience with this because I used to have an error, okay? A um, long time ago, I had an error. And I think back to the time when I had an error and when I got an error. And who thinks that when I got an error was a time when I was living a godly life? Anyone think that? No, it wasn't, okay? When I had an error, it was really associated with a very rebellious time. It was before I was saved. But it was a very rebellious time in my life, okay? When I was a lot younger, I, I, I got an earring. Um, I, I wore jewellery that I, I think I must have raided my mother's um, jewellery box to get to get jewellery. I, I had long hair, okay? You might find it hard to imagine nowadays. I had long hair and an earring, okay? And the thing is, those things are things that are actually associated with rebellion. You know, a guy going off and getting an earring... Um, often, not all, I mean, sometimes depending on the environment they're brought up with, it might just be because dad says this is the thing, because dad's got one and he brings up his children that way. I understand that can happen. In certain cultures, you'll find that stuff. But by and large, there's a lot of that where it's associated with the, the, the youth goes off and gets an earring. Why? Because it's a way of rebelling. Just like growing their hair long, it's a, way of, it's a way of rebelling, you see? And of course, the Bible speaks very clearly against men having long hair. Men are supposed to have short hair. Women are supposed to have long hair, okay? Because if a man has long hair, he looks a bit like a woman. It's an effeminate thing. For a man to have long hair, it's a womanly thing. It's effeminate. In fact, being effeminate 
like a man being having womanly attributes, that is a sin. It's listed in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. It is listed as, there's a list of sins, of drunkenness and all sorts of stuff, and it says effeminate is listed in there. So it's a bad thing for a man to look like a woman. Okay? And so, and even if you think about it, you think about the standard, think about some, who's, who's going to have long hair? Like a, a metler. You know, musicians. Heavy metal musicians. They've all got long hair, haven't they? You know, why? Because it's just a sign, it's an outward sign of the rebellion that goes on inside. And that, that's, that's what it is. And so, I don't think that men should wear earrings at all. I don't think, don't think they should. Now, am I saying you, you've got these really clear commands where God says, thou shalt not put an earring in? No, I don't. But at the same time, the Bible says that we should abstain from all appearance of evil. In fact, we sang it earlier on, abstain from all appearance of evil. Okay. And so the fact is that, you know, just like a man wearing long hair, wearing an earring, it's, it's associated with some bad things. It's, so, it's associated with, with um, uh, rebellion. It's associated with effeminacy, you know. I mean, it's, in fact, I, I do remember this. When I grew up, if you wore an earring in that ear, that meant that you were homo, didn't it? Yeah. So that, were, that ear was all right. It was okay to put it in that ear. But not that one, okay? But I've heard someone say, well, if you've got it there, not there, that means you're about this far away from being a homo, or at least looking like one. Now, I mean, nowadays, I don't think that's the case. You find men, they wear them in both, although, you know, you wear, they wear them in both ears and all sorts of stuff. But the fact is, we don't, we shouldn't look like the world. We shouldn't act like the world. We shouldn't dress like the world, you know? And so no, it doesn't matter what the movie stars are doing. It doesn't, what the, it doesn't matter what the musicians are doing. In fact, actually, if the movie stars are doing it, if the musicians are doing it, we shouldn't be doing it. You know? So we should have nothing to do with that. We shouldn't be like them. You know? And so I don't think it's a coincidence. I don't think anything that's in the Bible is there. It's just, it just happens to be. I mean, that, that verse that we read there, Aaron said unto them, Break off the gold mirrors which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters. I don't think that's just coincidence that it says that. You know? It's just a fact that when people go down this road of rebellion, they get the long hair, they get the earrings, they, they, they go into all sorts of things. That's, it's ungodly. And we, we as God's people should be, should be not like that at all. Let's get back in um, Genesis chapter 35. Genesis 35, verse number, verse number 5. <clears throat> and they journeyed, and the terror of God was upon the cities that were round about them. And they did not pursue after the sons of Jacob. So here we see, here we see God protecting them as they journeyed. You know? In fact, that's a, that's a promise that God gives us. If you look at, um, keep your finger in Genesis 35, but if you look at Deuteronomy chapter number 11, Deuteronomy chapter number 11, <coughs> verse number, look at verse number 16. Deuteronomy 11, 16 says, Take heed to yourselves, that your heart be not deceived, and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. Of course, they've put aside those other gods now, haven't they? And then the Lord's wrath be kindled against you, and he shut up the heaven that there be no rain, that the land yield not her fruit, unless you perish quickly from off the good land which the Lord giveth you. Therefore shall you lay up these my words in your heart and in your soul, and bind them for a sign upon your hand, that they may be as frontlets between your eyes, and you shall teach them your children, speaking of them, when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, when thou risest up. And thou shalt write them upon the doorposts of thine house and upon thy gates, that your days may be multiplied, and the days of your children, and the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers to give them as the days of heaven upon earth. Upon the earth. It's a great promise. Verse 22. For if ye shall diligently keep all these commandments which I command you, to do them, to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to cleave unto him, then will the Lord drive out all these nations from before you, and you shall possess uh, greater nations and mightier than yourselves. Every place where on the soles of your feet shall tread shall be yours. From the wilderness and Lebanon, from the river, the river Euphrates, even unto the utmost sea shall your coast be. Verse 25, There shall no man be able to stand before you. For the Lord your God shall lay the fear of you and the dread of you upon all the land that ye shall tread upon, as he hath said unto you. So don't, isn't that an example of what we've just seen here? They put away the gods... And what happened? People are scared of them. It says God, as they journeyed, the terror of God was upon the cities that were around about them. 
and they did not pursue after the sons of Jacob. <coughs> Verse number six. So Jacob came to Luz, which is in the land of Canaan, that is Bethel, he and all the people that were with him. And he built there an altar and called that place Al Bethel, because there God appeared unto him when he fled from the face of his brother. So they came to Bethel, um, you know, he built an altar there, and obviously an altar that represents worshipping God. Okay? And of course, it's associated with what? With Bethel. What's Bethel? The house of God. That's associated with church. Okay? And so worshipping God obviously is associated with church. Yeah, people say, well, I can worship God anywhere. You know, when I'm out in the countryside and in the etc. etc. And it's true you can worship God anywhere, but the fact is it's different when you come to church. Because many people who talk about worshiping God anywhere, when church is meeting, where are they? They're off out in the woods. Okay? And so it's an important thing. Worshiping God, we should another reason, and we see. Over and over throughout this chapter, we'll see Bethel is mentioned over and over again. Here it says El Bethel. It's like that's the God of the house of God. Because that's our El, El sense for God. Um, verse number 8. It says, But Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died, and she was buried beneath Bethel under an oak, and the name of it was Alon Bethel. So Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, dies. We don't know too much about her. Um, she gets mentioned um, back in Genesis chapter 24. Um, and obviously she's Rebecca's nurse, so you're wondering why is um, uh, why is she here with with, um, with Jacob? Probably suggests that, that that she was already that that maybe Rebecca had, had died by that stage. Um, it doesn't actually say, um, but yeah. So so she's with them, but she gets died and gets buried there. Then look at verse number nine. Verse number nine says, "And God appeared unto Jacob again when he came out of pain and Aram, Aram, and blessed him. And God said unto him, Thy name is Jacob." Thy name shall not be called any more Jacob, but Israel shall be thy name. And he called his name Israel. So God renames him. He calls him Israel instead of Jacob. Uh, verse number 11. And God said unto him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall be of thee. And kings shall come out of thy loins. And the land which I gave Abraham and Isaac, to thee I will give it. And to thy seed after thee will I give the land. So God tells Jacob, be fruitful, multiply. And he promises, he says, I'm going to give you the land which I was going to give to you know, your fathers, to Abraham and to Isaac. <coughs> Verse 13. And God went up from him in the place where he talked with him. And Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he talked with him, even a pillar of stone. And he poured a drink offering thereon and pour, he poured oil thereupon, thereon. And Jacob called the name of the place where God spake with him Bethel. So interestingly, again, each verse, it mentions the place where God talked with Jacob. Notice that, verse 13. He went up from, the, went up from him in the place where he talked with him. Okay? Um, verse 14, and Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he talked with him. And verse 15, and Jacob called the name of the place where God spake with him, Bethel. Okay? And so each one, it's talking about, you know, that, that place is Bethel, and it's the place where God talks with them. So that kind of reminds us that Bethel, which is church, that's we should come to church expecting to hear from God. Okay? Don't come along here and think, well, you know, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna hear from Ian. It's like I want to come along and hear from God. And that's why I pray and as I prepare the sermons, as I read in God's word, I'm wanting to give you what God has to say. Okay? And it's not that I just get up and I just read the Bible, because the Bible does ordain that we need preaching. You see, because otherwise we just have a, a book study. We just come, everyone would just sit here, just silent reading and go home. Silent reading and go home. But the fact is we need to take what's in the Bible and we need to apply it to our lives and apply it to today's world. Okay, because there are things around today that weren't necessarily around in, in certain other times, you know? And so, you know, that's why we need to bring the current issues out and apply them to today. Um, look at verse number... <clears throat> Verse number 16. Verse 16. And they journeyed from Bethel, and there, and there was but a little way to come to Ephrath, and Rachel travailed, and she had hard labour. And it came to pass, when she was in hard labour, that the midwife said unto her, Fear not, thou shalt have this son also. And it came to pass, as her soul was in departing, for she died, that she called his name Ben-Oni, but his father called him Benjamin. So Rachel has her second son, Benjamin. Remember, she'd already had Joseph. And, and she dies in childbirth. Verse number 19. And Rachel died and was buried in the way to Ephrath, which is Bethlehem. 
And Jacob set a pillar upon her grave. That is the pillar of Rachel's grave unto this day. So, so Jacob buries her near um, Bethlehem. Obviously, very uh, familiar place, Bethlehem, where, where Jesus was born. Um, and he marks her grave with some sort of a, some sort of a tombstone. And notice it says there, um, uh, this is the pillar of Rachel's grave unto this day. Now that doesn't mean that if you went there today, you would find a gravestone. Okay, we're talking thousands of years ago here. But when it says unto this day, that means at the time that this book was written, it was still there. So that means at the time of Moses. When Moses wrote this, you could have gone to Bethlehem or, or near wherever it was, near there, and you could have seen it. Okay, you're st still there to this day. And the interesting thing is, the Bible's like that. The Bible's full of lots of things that, because the Bible is true, it's not like some made-up story. It's actually something that's true, which means there's lots of details about stuff. You know, if you compare it to a book like the Quran, details on stuff, no, it's just all the sort of, there's, there's, there's not specific detail. It's just these sort of bizarre sayings and stuff is what's in it. Whereas the Bible is specifically set up to say, look, hey, this was here. These people were here. This happened at this time. And that's why many people have tried to disprove the Bible over the years. Sometimes people have been mentioned, like there was the Hittites, for example. We read about the Hittites in the Bible. And people said, oh, the Bible's not true because there's no such people as the Hittites. Never has been. There's no historical record of them. Shows the Bible's not true. But in the, I think it was in the 20th century that it might have been. Guess what they found? They found a whole pile of evidence of this whole nation of the Hittites. They found all these, you know, you know, stones and stuff with writing on and, you know, all sorts of artifacts that they found. And lo and behold, wow, this is the nation of the Hittites existed. Of course it did, because that, and that's why God records it. These are these things that are in there. And, so, and in this case, it's there to this day. Verse number 21. And Israel journeyed and spread his tent beyond the tower of Edar. And it came to pass, when Israel dwelt in that land, that Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine. And Israel heard it. <coughs> um, now the sons of Jacob were twelve. The sons of Leah, Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, and Simeon and Levi and Judah and Issachar and Zebulun. And the sons of Rachel, Joseph and Benjamin. And the sons of Bilhah, Rachel's handmaid, Dan and Naphtali. And the sons of Zilpah, Leah's handmaid, Gad and Asher. These are the sons of Jacob, which were born to him and paid in Aram. So Jacob, or Israel, if you like, keeps journeying. Reuben, his firstborn, sleeps with Bilhah. Okay? Now, that's a wicked sin, wicked sin that he did. And in fact, it's interesting, when Jacob blesses his children in Genesis 49, he says that, we're actually have a look, look at Genesis 49, start of Genesis 49, he actually brings this up. Genesis 49... Um, Genesis 49, oh, maybe look at verse number 2, uh, verse 1. And Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. Gather yourselves together and hear ye sons of Jacob and hearken unto Israel your father. Reuben, he says, Thou art my firstborn, my might, the beginning of my strength, the excellence of dignity and the excellence of power. It's all sounding pretty good. But then look at verse 4. Unstable as water, thou shalt not excel, because thou wentest up to thy father's bed. Then defilest thou it. He went up to my couch. So he's saying, look, Reuben, you're not going to excel because of the sin that you've committed, because of what you've done. And it's a pretty wicked sin, you know, to, to sleep with your father's concubine. Now, obviously, he shouldn't have had a concubine. You know, Jacob shouldn't have slept with Bilhar either. Guess what? Newsflash. But the fact is, it was a wicked sin that Reuben did. Um, and, and he remembered it for him. He's remembered for it. Um, and because of that, he wasn't going to excel. Verse number 27, back in Genesis 35. Verse 27. And Jacob came unto Isaac his father, unto Mamre, unto the city of Arba, which is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac sojourned. So Jacob comes to Isaac his father. This is Hebron. This is the place where um, Abraham and Sarah died in, in Hebron. Um, verse 28. And the days of Isaac were in 104 score years. So Isaac lived to be 180. Okay, he lived to be older than his father, older than Abraham. Mm. Verse number 29. And Isaac gave up the ghost and died and was gathered unto his people, being old and full of days. And his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. So even after, the, you know, they're getting on well now. They're getting together and, and, um, and burying um, their father. So throughout this chapter, the thing that was really repeated we saw it over and over again through this chapter. Coming up was, was Bethel. 
He went up to Bethel, and these things happened at Bethel. He built an altar at Bethel. And Bethel was where he called, you know, God talked to him at Bethel, etc. And so we see that Bethel is, is the house of God. Okay? Bethel is an important place. The house of God is an important place. We saw earlier on in 1 Timothy 3.15, but if I tarry long, then I may us know how the oughtest to um, behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Okay? And so the house of God, it's supposed to be the pillar and ground of the truth. God told Jacob to go to Bethel. He wants us to go to church, doesn't he? God wants us to go to church. Um, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 says, Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 says, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. When you come to church, you'll get provoked to do good works. I'll preach about good works. I'll provoke you to do them. Verse number 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. So it's important that we come to church. It's important that we gather together. It's important how we behave at church, that they must know how they ought us to, to behave ourselves in the, in the house of God, what we should do at church. I mean, when we come to church, what should we come to church for? Should we come to church because it's, well, it's just my weekly service, that's what I do, I'm just ticking it off. If I go to church, I mean, I'll, I'll go, I mean, a lot of people think I'll go to church, that's how I get to heaven. Go to church once a week. No. Why should we go to church? We should go to church to learn. We should go to church to learn. We should go to church with an open heart, with an open mind. We should go to church to, to listen to the preaching. We should go to church to lift up our voices and praise to God. You know, these are important things. We shouldn't be thinking about other things when we're at church. We should be focusing on what God wants us to do. We should be thinking about the lost. That's one of the things we come to church for. Because at church, I'm going to, I'm going to exhort us to go out and preach the gospel to the lost. And it, it reminds us of that. Because if someone doesn't come to church, you know what happens over time? They forget about the fact that people are dying and going to hell. And so they stop thinking, well, I really should go out and, and preach the gospel. Tell them how to be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But instead they're just thinking about, you know, and we all have different things in our day that we have to do. But one of the reasons why we come back to church, it helps us focus on what's important. Okay? But as we saw earlier on in the sermon, many churches, sadly, they're no longer the pillar and ground of the truth. Instead, they're actually filled with all sorts of wickedness that God is not happy about. And the fact is, we need to stand up as individuals and as a church against the false teachings that are, that are creeping into churches all over the world. You know, I mean, the fact is, um, Luke chapter 17, look at Luke 17. Jesus talked a bit about what it was going to be like when he comes back. Luke chapter 17 and verse number 22 Luke 17, 22 says, this, He said unto his disciples, The days will come when you should desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, you shall not see it. And they shall say, Do you see here or see there? Go not after them, you'll follow them. For as the lightning that lighteneth out of one part under heaven shineth unto the other part under heaven, so shall also the Son of Man be in his day. So when he comes back, you know, everyone's going to know about it. But first must he suffer many things and be rejected for this generation. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. So when, when Jesus comes back, it's going to be like it was in the time of Noah or, or Noah. So what was it like then? The earth was filled with violence. Well, guess what? The earth's going to be filled with violence. There's quite a lot of violence now. Um, they did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given a marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise also as it was in the days of Lot. They did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built it. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. So notice what it's seeing there. It's going to be like it was in the days of Lot. What was it like in the days of Lot? We know it was like in Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, guess what? Many churches are becoming like Sodom and Gomorrah now. They're saying, come on in. Come on in. We're inclusive. Come on in. We're, in a, we're an inclusive church. And if you're not inclusive then it's like there's something seriously wrong with you. You'll be ridiculed, you'll be hated, you'll be persecuted because of it. But it's something we shouldn't, we shouldn't forget. You know, I mean, so verse 30 says, even thus should we in the day when the Son of Man is revealed, uh, look at verse 32, remember Lot's wife. What happened to Lot's wife? She fled out of Sodom and Gomorrah. What did she do? She was looking back. Wasn't she? She was looking back. Where was her heart? Her heart was back there. Okay? We need to remember that. We need to take heed and we need to 
follow what God says. So when God says certain people shouldn't be allowed in the church, mm. we, need to, we need to listen to him. Not just say, everyone welcome. Everyone's welcome. Everyone come in. No. That's not what it's supposed to be. The Bible says, put away from among you that wicked person. That's what the Bible says. Okay? Look at, um, last place we'll look at maybe in, in John, uh, John 15, I think it is. John 15. <coughs> but the thing is, when you stand up for the truth, when you're a church that it stands up for the truth, when you're a person who stands up for the truth, you will be persecuted because of it. Jesus said in John 15, 18, to his disciples, he said, if the world hates you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. Think about people in Australia who stood up and said, no, gay marriage, same-sex marriage, it's wrong. Were they hated? They were. Well, guess what? Jesus was hated too. He says, if you're of the world, the world would love his own. But because you're not of the world, but I've chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you. The sermon is not greater than his Lord. If they've persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they've kept my saying, they'll keep yours also. So if we're following Jesus, we will be persecuted. The Bible says, yea, and all that will of God be in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. He didn't say they might. He said they shall. Okay? Um, look down in um, chapter 16. Chapter 16, verse number 2, he says, They shall put you out of the synagogues, you know, the meeting houses. They'll put you out of them. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. It's, I mean, it's, it's, it's still mild relatively, but that, Jesus said that's what it's going to be like. There will be a time when churches are closed, good churches are closed in New Zealand, because they stand for the truth. They say, oh, you preach and believe the Bible, they're not going to put up with it. They'll close you down. No, you can't be a registered charity anymore. We'll close you down. You can't, you can't go and whatever. That's what's going to happen. I mean, isn't that what he said? That is what's going to happen. And yet we see today all these churches, they're all moving. They're all moving. And when you see all the churches moving, that's not where we should be going. We're going to stay. We're going to be a pillar and ground of the truth. We're going to stand on what God's word says and not be moved. It doesn't matter how many people say, all welcome. You must be inclusive. If you're not inclusive, then you're hateful. Don't care. Jesus didn't say that the church should be inclusive. There were people who were to be excluded from the church. That's what he said. Mm -hmm. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you for your word. And Lord, we thank you for um, the example in, in Jacob's life. We thank you for Bethel. We thank you for the house of God. Lord, I thank you for this church. Lord, I pray that you would protect this church for as long as possible, Lord. I pray you'd protect it from, um, from grievous wolves coming in, from people um, rising up and, and speaking perverse things. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to stand for the truth, not to be ashamed of the truth. Help us to continue to preach the gospel, to be a light in the midst of a dark place. Lord, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for the free gift of salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.